All right, let's take our Bibles tonight, open the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter number 12, and uh, man, I'll tell you, I had a great start to our Bible Institute on Monday night. Um, I think we've got over 40 uh, that are enrolled in the personal evangelism class, and so that's awesome uh, to see those wanting to learn how to uh, share their faith, or some just kind of getting a refresher on it and uh, trying to uh, learn more about it, and so that's exciting to see, and so um, uh, I'm excited uh, to see what the Lord's going to do through that. Uh, obviously, the more we know how to share our faith, the more we can reach people with the gospel, uh, and that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter number 12, and um, we're kind of looking through this. Um, basically beginning in verse, um, verse number 12, that's kind of where we started last week, and um, going down through verse number 17, uh, really didn't get very far, but we're going to kind of read through it together to kind of know where we're at. In verse number 12, he says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So we've been looking in chapter 12, the author is talking about this race that we're running. And in the first couple verses, he talks about how we're to run the race. Uh, he tells us each one of us are in a race. Uh, we're all running. And he tells us how to run. Um, you know, he tells us what we need to, to take off, you know, what we need to lay aside, uh, the weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. He tells us where to look, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then in... Basically, in verse number 5 down to verse number 11, we, he shows us what to do uh, or really what our Father, our Heavenly Father will do when we kind of start getting off track um, and how our Heavenly Father will uh, discipline us uh, just like our earthly fathers do when we start getting off track and to bring us back to where we need to be in this race that he's called us to run. And, and then last week as we were looking... Um, kind of in the same idea of this race, he tells us we just need to keep running it. Um, and a- as long as we are alive, we are to keep running this race that God has for us. Um, this is not a, a short 100-meter uh, dash, right? Uh, this is uh, a long, long race. We talked about some of those races that uh, these people do throughout the world, these 100-mile races and races that go on and on and on. And he talks about how it's important for us to, to run this race, but understanding that there are times in the race that we get tired. Understanding times in this race we get discouraged and, um, you know, we, we get weak. And that's what he says in verse number 12, right? Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, right? And when you've been running a race, I mean, uh, your knees are weak, you're, you're just exhausted, and uh, you just don't want to go any farther, uh, but he says, hey, that we need to encourage those uh, in this race uh, because it's not just us that are running the race. Every single one of us as Christians are running in this race. Now, every one of us has a different race to run, uh, but every one of us are running, and so we need to encourage one another. And when we see somebody that is, uh, is discouraged, somebody that's falling by the wayside, Instead of just leaving them there, we ought to uh, try to encourage them and try to help them and, and lift them up um, and, and to strengthen them. That's what he says, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And then verse 13, make straight paths for your feet. Uh, how important it is that we realize that uh, there are those coming behind us that are following us and we need to make sure that we're running a, a, a right path, uh, making sure that we're not... Uh, leaving obstacles in, in, in our wake and that they're going to trip over and fall over. And so making sure that we're running uh, a path that is easy for them to follow. And then as he kind of um, explains this, and then he kind of gives us some ideas of what we ought to be doing in running this race, right? 
Uh, again, there are those that are watching us. Uh, if we fail and we quit, then they too will fall by the wayside, right? That's what he's talking about, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Um, and so he tells us there are some things that we need to do uh, in this race that we're running. Verse number 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So notice the first thing he tells us we are to do. Again, this is not for a specific person. This is not just for pastors. This is not just for missionaries. This is not just for deacons. This is not just for Sunday school teachers. This is for everybody in the race. Everybody, right? So if, if you're a Christian, you are in this race. So that means this is for you. This is part of how we are to, to run this race. And watch what he says. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. So while we run, we are to make every effort to follow peace, he says. Um, now again, it's, it's not supposed to be about me, right? It's, this life is not supposed to be about me. Who is this life supposed to be about as a Christian? Who is this life supposed to be about? It's about Jesus Christ, right? We're, we're following the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, uh, he is that example. That's why he says in verse number two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So as I follow the Lord, then I am to make every effort to live peaceably with those around me. As I'm following him, then I need to make every effort I can to live peaceably with all of those around me. He says, follow peace with all men. In fact, this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verse number 18, he says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So Paul tells us this, the author of Hebrews says, in this race, if we're going to, to make this path, we're going to run a race that others can follow, he says, we need to live peaceably with all men. Follow peace with all men. So can I ask this evening, right? When we think about our life, we think about how we're running right now. I'm not talking about how you ran five years ago or how you ran last year. I'm talking about how you're running right now. Are you running in a way to keep peace with all men? Now, before you start saying, well, you know, there's, there's some people I just can't make peace with things. Please understand, I'm not saying we compromise Scripture to keep peace. That's not what I'm saying, right? I'm not saying we compromise and we don't preach about sin or anything like that so that we can keep the peace. No, that's not what I'm saying, okay? Not it at all, right? Again, this peace that we are trying to, to keep is not just an absence of, uh, of strife, right? It's not just a... a, a keeping people happy with us. That's not, that's not what peace is really talking about, right? Um, this peace that we are to try to, to uh, follow after is the peace of God. We're supposed to be following his peace, and as we follow his peace, then we can live at peace with others around us, right? Even if there are people that disagree with us, even if there are people that hate us, we can still live at peace, you say, well, how's that possible? Well, I mean, don't, didn't, don't you think they hated Jesus when he lived on the earth? I think they did, right? I mean, they, they pretty much hated him over and over and over. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him. And yet Jesus lived at peace. Now, he didn't compromise. He didn't compromise the word. He didn't compromise against sin. But he lived at peace among those that are around us. So two questions dealing with this idea of following peace with all men. Are you ready for them? <laughs> Are we living peaceably with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Now, this is what he says. Follow peace with all men, right? So are we living peaceably with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Because you have to understand, the devil will use conflict between the family of God to destroy the church. It's, it's easy for the devil to try to bring persecution from the outside and try to bring persecution against the church. But that's, that many times, that actually strengthens the church. 
when there's persecution from the outside. Yes, I understand if sometimes people leave or whatever because of persecution, but many times that is a, that is a strengthening time for the, the true body of Christ. But a way that the devil uses many times, and whether I've seen it happen in America, I've seen it happen in Uganda, I know it happens in every country of the world. The way the devil uses to get the church divided is not from bringing persecution from the outside, but it's getting believers on the inside to hate each other. Getting believers from the inside to fight and to squabble and to get upset. Because the devil knows if he can get us not to live peaceably in the church, right? If he can get us to squabble and to fight, what's going to happen many times to the church? It's going to split. It's going to split, and it's going to be fighting against itself instead of fighting against the true enemy that we have. And so the devil will use, and and, and please understand, you know, we've been going through the book of Ephesians on Sunday nights, right? Ephesians chapter 6, and he talks about our enemy, right? And, And he, God doesn't use words just because he thinks, oh, well, let me just throw some words in here, Right? This is the word that God uses here in Ephesians chapter 6 in talking about our enemy, right? We've been going through this. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, you think that's just a word that God just decided to throw in there? The wiles of the devil? No, of course not. Because God knows exactly who our enemy is. God knows that our enemy, the devil is going to use trickery. He's going, to, he's going to do anything he can to try to deceive us into thinking we're right and everybody else is wrong, right? He's going to use anything he can. I mean, it can be, it, honestly, folks, it can be some of the silliest things. Some of the silliest things to divide a church. Silly things. You know some of the silly things I've heard that have divided churches? Paint color. No, I'm not joking. Paint color divided a church. The lights that were put in divided a church. What we sit on divides churches. I'm not joking. The, the, that's, that's some of the silly things that the devil will use to get Christians fighting against each other. Now, let's, 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 what difference does any of those things make? Whether you use LEDs or whether you use, you know, what are the old types of bulbs? I can't even remember now. What is it? Incandescent, right? Whether you use... LEDs or whether you use incandescents or you use fluorescents, who cares? Right? Whether the wall is white or whether the wall is gray, who cares what color it is? What, 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 is, what is the color of a wall? What is the, the lights? What are the, whether we have, you know, pews or whether we have chairs, what, what difference does that make? You know, you go to a lot of countries, you know what they sit on? The floor. Maybe that's what we should do. Maybe we should just get rid of all the chairs, right? That's all it, right? We're not going to have pews. We're going to have hair. You're just going to come in and sit on the floor. How'd you like that? (laughs) I don't think that'd go over with. We'd probably have a church split over that, wouldn't we? (laughs) But see, that's, that's that's how silly things can be. And this is exactly what he's saying. God says, if we're going to run, now remember, he says we're running this race and we want to run in a way that the, 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 the track or whatever you want to call it that we're leaving behind for other people to follow does not cause them to stumble. It doesn't cause them to, to fall by the wayside. We're leaving a clear path for them to follow. And he says, if we want to do that, he says, here's what you got to do. Live peaceably with all men. Follow peace with all men. It's interesting when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, 
And the book of Philippians is a wonderful book. I love the book of Philippians. It's such an encouraging book to me personally. But there's, there's, you can't really find anything where Paul deals with doctrinal problems uh, or, or issues in the church. But there's, there's one verse that I find really interesting that Paul kind of puts in here. Obviously, it's under the inspiration of God. But there's a verse in chapter 4 where Paul tells two ladies to cut it out. He says, knock it off. Because it wasn't doing the testimony of Christ any good. He says, I beseech Iodius and Syntec that they be of the same mind. Paul calls them out. Can you, can you believe that, right? In a letter that he wrote to the church. He said, hey, you two ladies, knock it off. That's pretty strong language, right? I mean, stop it. You've got to be of the same mind. You've got to understand we're, we're on the same team. Why? Why, you know why the, really the, the devil's not afraid of the church? It's because the church is fighting itself. The church is fighting itself instead of fighting the devil. And, and when, we, when we squabble and fight over silly things, we get our feelings hurt and we think, well, well my way should have been the right way or I should have had a say in this or they didn't ask me or they didn't ask my opinion and, and we just... Look, do you know what that goes back to? Do you know what the root cause of that is? It's pride. That's the root cause of it, right? You go back, to, that's exactly what, why Satan fell. Lucifer fell. Why? He said, I'm not content with the way God made me to be. Even though I'm the greatest angel that God made, I'm not content. God didn't ask me about how creation ought to be. God didn't ask me about things. So you know what? I'm not content. Therefore, I want to become God. Pride. That's what, that's what caused Lucifer to fall was pride. You know, that's exactly what he uses in many churches. If I can get these brothers and sisters to fight amongst themselves and get their pride stirred up that it's all about them, He's got it. And this is why he says it's so important to follow peace with all men. Go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 6. In Proverbs chapter 6, there's a really important passage here. I mean, obviously all scripture is important, but kind of on this subject. In Proverbs chapter 6, notice what he says in verse 16. He says, These six things doth the Lord hate, Right? So that's, that's pretty bad, right? These six things doth the Lord hate. But then he says, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. So he said there's six things that God really hates, but the seventh is just an abomination to God. Notice the very first one, a proud look. You know what God says about a proud look? I hate it. God says, I hate it. Why? Because it'll bring us down. It's going to bring us to destruction. He says, a proud look a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Hello. That ought, to, that ought to be something right there about who you vote for. Hands that shed innocent blood. A, uh, and heart that deviseth wicked imagination. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. So there's six things. What's the seventh thing that God says in his abomination? He that soweth discord among brethren. God says, there, there, there's six things that I absolutely hate, but I'm telling you, he says, the seventh is just an abomination to me. Sowing discord among brethren. Why? Because they're supposed to be the same family. They're supposed to be together in this. Right? I mean, look, I, I know my, my brothers and I and my sister, you know, we can squabble and, and we can fight about different things and, and they have their opinion and I have my opinion, though mine is always right, um, you know, well, most of the time. <laughs> but you know what? At the end of the day, we're, we're family. At the end of the day, we're not going to let some little thing keep us from serving God together. We're, we're going we're gonna to keep serving the Lord. We're going to keep doing what God wants us to do. And as Christians, we've got to come to the point and say, hey, you know what? I may disagree with them on this, and I may, I may have picked eggshell instead of gray. 
You know, I may have picked LEDs instead of incandescence. I may have picked uh, a different color for the, the chairs, or I may have picked a different color for the carpet. But you know what? At the end of the day, we're on the same team. At the end of the day, we're on the same family. And I'm not going to let the devil get in and destroy this family. And he says we are to follow peace with all men. And again, that's why he says that seventh thing is an abomination to God. He that sows discord among the brethren. So let me ask you. Again, because we all, look, we all face pride. We all deal with pride. Every single one of us deals with pride. From starting from me all the way down. Everybody deals with pride. Okay. So what do we do when pride starts getting in? What do we do when someone offends us because they didn't take our suggestion or they chose to do something different than what we thought should have been done? What do we do when, you know, I mean, God, for, God forbid we come to church and you know what? They walked right by me and they didn't shake my hand. What do we do? I can, I can tell you what most of us do. We get upset. We get mad. And we think, oh, how dare they? And you know what we need to do? We need to, take, we need to listen to Paul's advice and say, knock it off. Knock it off. Come on, guys. Ladies, stop it. That's what Paul was saying. Hey, Iodia Syntec, Stop it. You're on the same team. Be of the same mind. Look, we're, we're in this fight together. We're in this race together. Instead of trying to, to cause someone to fall and trip them up or put something in their way to make them fall, let's encourage them. Let's help them. Let's get, let's get going together. Let's do something for Christ. But we get so caught up in this pettiness. We get so caught up in pride then instead of trying to be at peace with all men, we can't even be at peace with our own brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, here's the question. If we can't be at peace with our own family and our own brothers and sisters in Christ, how in the world are we supposed to be at peace with the world? Because that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And so he says, look, and, and I, you know, I tell people all the time, the easiest way... And, and the one thing that I, I don't know if this is more than anything else, but the one thing that I absolutely do not want ever going on in this church is gossip. Gossip. Because that's, that's going to turn people against other people, and then now you're getting clicks, and now you're getting people in groups, and like, well, can you believe what that person did to this person? And they're my friend. Well, can you believe what they said against this person? Well, they're my friend, you know, and we just start fighting. I told people, the easiest way to get a gossip, to stop gossiping, is this. Let's say Brother Gene comes to me, and Brother, Brother Gene didn't do this, but let's just say Brother Gene comes to me. He says, boy, i got to tell you something about Brother Chuck. And I know it's going to be gossip. The easiest way for me to stop Brother Gene, and what he's doing, by, notice Brother Gene and Brother Chuck are sitting together, okay? So we're not, we're, not, we're not having any problems here, all right? It's not like Brother Gene sitting over there and Brother Chuck sitting over here, okay? They're sitting right next to each other, all right? So this is not a problem. This is just an illustration, okay? Don't go out and be like, oh, what's going on with Brother Gene and Brother Chuck, you know? <laughs> stop it. Knock it off, right? <laughs> okay. Brother Gene comes to me and says, oh, I got I to gotta tell you about Brother Chuck. You know, I can't believe he did this. And I can tell already it's just, it's just going to be gossip, right? What's the easiest way to stop it? Hold on, Brother Gene. Let me, let me call Brother Chuck and let me get him on the phone. We'll put him on speaker or we'll set up a time where we can meet together and then you can tell me what you need to tell me in front of Brother Chuck. You think he's going to want to do that? I don't think so. Now, if it's something that is a serious issue, maybe he might, and that might be something that we need to address. But if it's just gossip, there's no way he's going to want to tell it in front of Brother Chuck, uh, Brother Chuck because he knows it may not be true. It's just something that maybe he heard. Or may... You see, this is what he's saying. You've got to recognize and say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not going to allow this because as soon as I start listening to his gossip, what's that going to start making me do? It's going to start making me think bad about Brother Chuck. 
or vice versa. And so this is why he says, hey, we have to follow peace with all men, right? So I've got to make sure, first of all, I'm following peace with my brothers and sisters in Christ. But now here's the second question. Am I following peace with the rest of the world? Am I trying to be at peace? Am I trying to follow, live peaceably with the world? Can I ask you, what is your testimony like to the world? What is your testimony to the world? Now, if I can say this. If it's not good among your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's probably not good in the world. You know, how, how sad is it that somebody would say, boy, I would never go to that church because that person is there. I would never go to that church because that person that calls himself a Christian, they go to that church, and so I would never go there. You think I'm lying? I've, I've, I've had people tell me that. Would never go there because that person that calls himself a Christian goes there. What have we done? We've lost our testimony. We've lost our testimony. And look, it, it's, it's important that we keep our testimony among believers, but friend, can I tell you, it's important that we keep our testimony to a lost world too. It's important. Brother Jay mentioned this um, a couple weeks ago when I was gone in his message, and he talked about how... Um, you know, even like on social media and things, that for, for whatever reason, um, and by the way, this is not just Christians, I think this is just people in general, but we think because it's social media, it's, it doesn't really matter how we say things. Friend, you're a Christian whether you're on social media or not. It doesn't matter, right? They say, well, it's, just, it's on social media. Yeah, that means a lot more people are seeing it. What's your testimony like now? Well, I told them what I think. Yeah, you did, and you just lost your testimony. Well, somebody needs to tell them. You understand, there is a right way and a wrong way to tell people things. And if we're going to tell them in such a way that we lose our testimony, that we can't live peaceably with them, you understand we're probably not doing it right. We're probably not doing it right. And this is why he says, follow peace with all men. Look, if, if our testimony to a world, what about to those that you work with, those that you work around? What is your testimony like to them? What about to your neighbors? What, what is your testimony like to them? Do they, do they know that you're a Christian and that you, you have a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ? Look, you may, they may disagree with you and you may disagree with them, and that's fine. You know, I don't know how we got to this place in our country, but it's, we've come to this point in our, in our country, in our society, that if you, don't disagree with, if you don't agree with me, then you shouldn't even live in this country. What? You understand? My own wife doesn't even agree with me all the time. <laughs> Yet we think everybody, if, if nobody agrees with me, that they should just leave the country. Wait, do you think everybody agreed with Jesus? I think there were a lot of people that disagreed with Jesus. And yet, what did Jesus do? He still died for them. He died for them, even though he knew they disagreed with him. He came to give us, by the way, that was you and I, by the way. Let's not forget where we were. We can think, oh, yeah, that was horrible. No, that was us too. He died for us when we didn't agree with him. We have to understand, God says, look, if we're going to run this race in such a way that others can follow, we have to live peaceably with all men. He says, follow peace with all men. Think about what else he says here. He says, looking, or excuse me, follow peace with all men and holiness. Now, these, this kind of goes together, right? To live with, at peace, but then he says, and also holiness. So he says, follow peace with all men and holiness. 
without which no man can see the Lord. So understand, if, if we're truly going to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have to recognize that God is a holy God. He's a holy God. He does not accept sin. He does not condone sin. There is a payment that must be made for sin. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he says, now those who have put their faith and trust in him are to live a holy life. We are to live in a way that pleases and honors God. So what does it mean to live a holy life? Where if we are to follow Christ and fellowship with him, then we should hate evil and follow that which is holy. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 15 and 16, he says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's our lifestyle. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Peter says, if you're saved, he says, then God has called us to live a holy life. A holy life. That's what God has called us to do. Why? Because he is holy. It's interesting. Paul says something very similar in Romans chapter 12, verse number 9. He says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So if we're going to live a holy life, we have to hate evil, and we have to cleave to that which is good. Isn't it interesting? That's very similar to what was said about Job, wasn't it? Job was a perfect man who eschewed evil. He loved God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. This is what he's saying. If we're going to be holy, we have to hate evil and to cling and to hold to that which is good. We are living in a world and a society that has turned everything upside down. Good is now evil, and evil is now good. But just because good is being called evil doesn't mean we shouldn't cleave to it still. We don't, we don't follow the world's philosophy of what is good and evil. We have to go back to what does God say is good and evil. We, we don't follow what the world says is truth. We follow what God says is truth. You see, we don't, we don't make it up. We just follow what God says. That's all we're supposed to do. God says, you don't have to make up truth. You just follow my truth. You don't, have to, you don't have to make up evil. You don't have to make up good. You just follow what I say is good. You just follow what I say is evil. You just trust me because, by the way, God's the only one that really knows what is good and evil anyway. God's the only one that really knows what is true and holy and just and righteous because he is true and holy and just and righteous. Because if it was left up to us, look, we would do exactly what the world does. We would call good evil and evil good. And so God says it's, it's, it's what he has done. And so we are to abhor what is evil, cleave to that is good. If we're claiming to be a Christian, then we ought to live and act like a child of God. I'm, I'm like Brother Jay, you know. It, it absolutely frustrates me when I, when I see people, whether it's on Facebook or even obviously in personal lives and things, when they claim to be a Christian and, and then they go to work and they have no problem, you know, cussing up a blue streak and, uh, you know, telling dirty jokes and do all these type of things, you know, and then they just come to church on Sunday and think everything's okay. You know, or they get on social media and they'll, they'll say whatever they want to people and be derogatory toward people and just make people feel like imbeciles and, and everything like that and then come to church on Sunday. Oh, everything's okay. Look, you understand, that's not a holy life. That's not living a holy life the way God wants us to live. I'm not saying we can't have an opinion and I'm not saying we can't share our opinion. But there is a right way and a wrong way. There is a way to do it. The Bible says we are to speak the truth, but we are to speak the truth in not hate, love. The world is already full of hate. They don't need to see hate in a Christian. They need to see the love of Christ in a Christian. Look, we're going to stand for truth. We, we have this idea, well, if we love people, then that means we're going to compromise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I don't think God compromised. And yet he still loved. Did he say sin is sin and sin has to be paid for and there's a payment for sin? Yes. 
Does he say if you don't accept his payment for sin, that that person will spend eternity in hell? Yes. But does he still love them? Absolutely. You see, there is a right way and a wrong way to speak truth. And unfortunately, we, we have allowed the world to influence how we speak truth. And we need to get back to the word of God and say, God, I need to live a holy life. I need to make sure the words coming out of my mouth are holy. I need to make sure the words coming out of my mouth are good words and righteous words and words that are edifying, not tearing things down, not tearing people down, but lifting up and encouraging. This is what he says in 1 John chapter 4. In 1 John chapter 4, just over a couple of pages, in 1 John chapter 4, in verse number 20, this is what he says. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother. Now, I didn't say this. These are not my words. These are God's words. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother. What are those next four words? He is a liar. He's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? He says, you, you say you love God, but you can't love your brother. You say you love God, but you can't live peaceably. You can't follow peace with all men. God says, that's not measuring up. I'm sorry. That's not measuring up. Look, friend, I'm not saying it's easy to love people. I'm not saying it's easy to live at peace because we all have a flesh. We all have a desire to be able to say what we want to say and just leave it where it's at, right? Well, I'll just speak it, let the chips fall where they may. Is that the right way to do it? Is that what God would want us to do? And so we've got to come back and say, all right, Lord, how can I live a holy life? I want to follow peace with all men and holiness. This is what James says. Again, it's, it's interesting. It's all throughout Scripture. It's not like they're just pulling out one verse and saying, this is how you're supposed to live. No, no. In James chapter, four, verse, or James chapter 3, verse number 17, but the wisdom that is from above, what do you think that means? Where is this wisdom from? It's from God, right? It's from God. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then, what's that next word? Well, there it is again, isn't it? Peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. He says the wisdom that is from above, this exemplifies it. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You see, this is why God says it's so important because this is, we are setting the example. As we are looking to Jesus, we're saying, hey, as I'm following Jesus, I am doing what Jesus would do. How can I say I'm following Jesus and I'm not wanting to live peaceably with those around me? How can I say that I'm following Jesus and I'm not wanting to live a holy life? You know what God says about me? I am a liar. Don't, don't say you love God. Just be honest. Hey, I love myself more than I love God. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it more than the way I, God wants me to live it. So I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and I'm just going to do it. But don't turn around and say, oh, but I love God too. No, he says you don't says you don't not if you're going to live this way you can't turn around and say oh but i love god too he says you cannot do that the wisdom that is from above is pure and peaceable gentle easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality without hypocrisy he said that's how god desires for us to live that is a holy life you want to know what holiness is there there's a great example of it right there in james chapter 3 verse 17 that's, that's the example of holiness. Why? Because that's how the Lord Jesus Christ lived. You want to, did, did he not live pure? Was he not peaceable? Gentle? Easy to be entreated? 
full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality. Aren't you glad he was without partiality? Aren't you glad he didn't say, well, salvation is for some and not for some others? Salvation is for this group of people, but not this group of people. It's for this language, but not this language. No, he said it's for anybody. Without partiality, without hypocrisy. You see, he says that's how he desires us to live as well. Again, that's why he says, hey, this race, it's, it's a long-distance race. And he says, as we're running this race, we've got to remember there are those coming behind us that are following this path that we're going to live. How are they seeing? Are they seeing us live peaceable? Are they seeing us live holy? Are they seeing us argue and fight with everybody else? Can I can tell you this. If they're seeing us argue and fight and everything in the church, you know what that's going to do to them? That's going to make it really hard for them to run the race. If they see that we can't live peaceable with our neighbors and our coworkers, and hey, we might disagree, but you know what? I'm still going to love them. I'm still going to care about them. If they can't see us doing that, you know what? It's going to be really hard for them to run the race because they have no example to follow. If they don't see us living a holy life, and this is why he says it's so important that we understand exactly what he's saying here. Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 12. He says, make straight paths for your feet, lest they which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And here he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look, if we're not living peaceable, And if we're not living holy, how are they going to see Jesus? How how are they going to see Jesus? Without which no man shall see the Lord. You see, we're supposed to be looking unto Jesus. That's what he said back in verse number two. Looking unto Jesus. So as I'm looking unto Jesus, I'm doing what he does. I'm living the life he lives. That's why he says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm just letting Christ live his life through me. I'm yielded to him so that he can live his life through me, peaceable, holy. Why? So that they can see him. His desire is so that they see Jesus Christ through our lives. What do they see when they look at your life? Do they see Jesus? Or do they see somebody that is just living for self? Do they see someone that is living peace with all men? Do they see someone who's living a holy life? Or is it just about me and my life? And so this is why he says, hey, this is, this is how we're supposed to run this race. We've got to run in a way that it's going to leave a clear example for others to follow. Are we living a holy life? Are we following peace with all men? If not, guess what? We got to start. We got to get started on that. Why? Because they need to see Jesus, not how wicked we are. They need to see Jesus, not my pride. They need to see Jesus, not my preferences. They need to see him. And that can only happen as I yield to him and let him live through me. Father, I pray you'd help us. Lord, we need to understand how important this is. That if, if we're going to allow other Christians in the world to see Jesus in our life, there's a certain way that you want us to live, a certain way that you want us to run this race so that others can follow. Lord, we, we know the devil is going to do everything he can to get us to fight, to get our pride to be lifted up, to be offended because of what somebody else did or didn't do. Lord, I pray that if we would simply yield to you and follow you, Lord, you can help us to overcome that. You can help us to get victory over that and to live peaceably with our brothers and sisters in Christ. You can help us to live peaceably with the world, even though there might be people at work or there might be people in our neighborhood that they may just, they may just not be the nicest people 
They might say some of the meanest things, but Lord, if we will follow you and we will trust you and live in a way that brings honor and glory to you, we can live peaceably with them. Lord, help us to live a holy life. A holy life in a way that people can just look at us and there's something different about them. That they can see it's not us but it's Jesus living through us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us in this. We need, we need Christians to just, as Paul said, to knock it off. Stop being children. Be mature Christians and run this race that we have while we can. Because there are people around us that need to know about Jesus Christ. They need to see you. And the only way they will see you is through the lives of Christians. And Lord, help us to be the right example. Help us not to lose our testimonies. Lord, help us to live in a way that honors you and helps them to see Jesus living through us. With their heads bound and their eyes closed, the piano's just going to play softly a verse or two here. Maybe there's something God's spoken to your heart about tonight. Maybe right now, just where you're at, just say, Lord, is there something in my life that's not right? Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's in your family. I don't know what it is. He says, follow peace with all men and holiness. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. Are we going to allow pride to get in the way of somebody seeing Jesus? Are we going to allow pride to get in the way split the family of God fight and quarrel amongst ourselves it says follow peace with all men so how do I do that you're going to need his strength you're going to have to yield to the spirit instead of yield to the flesh and holiness living a life that is holy before God. Why? Without which, no man can see the Lord. How else are they going to see Jesus if not through you? Lord, I pray you'd help us to live in such a way that people would be able to see Jesus in us and how we speak. Lord, whether it's through Facebook and Instagram and so all these social media devices, outlets, Lord, I pray you'd help us even through that, that people would see Jesus in us. Help us to remember we're, we're setting an example for others. We're letting other people see Jesus in how we live and how we speak and how we act. Lord, I I pray you'd help us to examine our hearts tonight and say, am I, am I being the right testimony? Am I being the right example for others to see Jesus in us? Lord, we can live in a way that is following after peace, that is holy, but it takes us being willing to set aside our pride and just look to you and to follow you and how you want us to live and be obedient in that. So, Father, I pray you'd help us to run this race that we're running in a way that brings honor and glory to you so that others can follow in a right way as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.